This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Pulitzer Prize-winning author and sociologist Matthew Desmond discusses his book, Poverty by America. He shares his views on how Americans can spread their wealth so that everyone is prosperous. He's interviewed by New York Times reporter and author Jason DeParle. Congratulations on a beautifully written, passionately argued, powerful, provocative book that's caused an awful lot of people to think or rethink their views on poverty and their obligations to the poor. It's a tremendous achievement. To some of our viewers, you're a household name. Others may be encountering your work for the first time. You're a Princeton sociologist, best known for your Pulitzer Prize winning book, Evicted, which masterfully combined data analysis and ethnographic research. You showed that evictions were a much larger problem than most of us had understood, larger both in the sense that more people were affected and that the consequences were more dire and enduring than most of us had imagined. You also lived among low-income renters in Milwaukee for that book, gained their trust, and wrote compelling, insightful portraits of their lives. Your new book, Poverty by America, is a different kind of book, more of a call to action, a manifesto, than a work of social science or reportage. I should note that I had the pleasure of joining a discussion group that brainstormed with you about an early draft. We'll get to the book in a minute, but let's start with you. What got you interested in poverty? Thanks, Jason. Uh, it means a lot coming from you. I grew up pretty poor. I grew up in a small railroad town in Arizona. Um, our gas got shut off often. Uh, and when I was in college, my family lost our home to foreclosure. And I think that experience shamed me. I, I was embarrassed. But I also think a part of me wondered why this is how we dealt with problems when families fell on hard times. And I saw how poverty stressed my family, d- diminished us. And I think that that grew a kind of a hatred of poverty in me and also a confusion about why there's so much desperation and hardship in this land of money. What did your parents do? My dad was a small town preacher and my mom worked like everywhere. She did all kinds of jobs. And when my dad lost his job uh, at the pulpit, that's when the family fell on really tough times. I saw somewhere you said you initially blamed your dad. Um, yeah. Uh, that caught my interest in that it might be um, a clue to some of the passion you bring to this book. Can you share what you feel comfortable sharing about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, he was an authority figure. You know, he I, I saw him as like a lot of kids see their, their parents, as someone that was completely in control until suddenly he wasn't. And the feelings that I had watching my family lose their home, they're feelings that I saw in Milwaukee when I was spending time with families who were getting evicted. A lot of those families blame themselves, you know, even though this was a problem affecting millions and millions of folks like them around the country. And C. Wright Mills, the famous mid-century sociologist, has this line where he says the sociologist's job is basically to take personal problems and turn them into political ones. And so part of my career, I think, has been taking nice. things that I experienced, including as, as a child, and turning them into more social or political issues. One last question about that. What turned your anger, if that's the right word, away from your father towards larger social forces? I think going to college, you know, was incredibly confusing to me in a way. I went to my state school, Arizona State University, with all the student loans and tuition money that I could scrounge up. And I worked all these jobs. I worked as a firefighter and a telemarketer and you name it. But around me was just a lot of money. You know, I just saw a kind of affluence that I had never seen before. Uh, It probably wasn't a a serious affluence looking back on it, but to me, it looked like a lot of riches. And it was just so confusing and, and baffling to me. And I think that drove me to the library. It drove me to spend a lot of time with homeless folks around my campus, just talking with them, listening to their stories. And it ultimately drove me into my discipline, sociology, to understand why there's so much poverty in America. Ultimately, it took you to Milwaukee, where you reported on, lived among, researched low-income housing, um, and showed the exploitation that many of the low-income renters you lived with experienced. Tell me how you got from that work to your current book, Poverty by America? What's the intellectual connection? Yeah, I mean, 
in Milwaukee, I saw a level of poverty that I had never seen and experienced before. You know, I met I met grandmas living without heat in the winter in Wisconsin. You know, they would just spend the winter under blankets and pray the space heater didn't burn out. Um, I remember this one eviction move that I was on where the sheriff arrived at this house. It was like a cold, rainy day. And there were just kids living in the house, just kids. And the mom had died and the kids had just gone on living there until the sheriff arrived. And so the sheriff evicted the kids, put all their stuff on the on the wet curb. The landlord drilled a new lock. Someone called social services and we were off to the next eviction. I saw a level of poverty that was incredibly cruel and, and painful. And it drilled home in me that this is a morally urgent issue. This isn't just about people not having enough money. This is about pain on top of eviction on top of hunger, on top of incarceration, on top of just death, really. And you portrayed that with incredible skill and power. So why this book? What are you trying to do here that you didn't previously do? Uh, Answer the why question. Why? Why? Why so much poverty in this incredibly wealthy nation? And I think that books like Evicted, books that bear witness, uh, have a power and, and a necessity, but they can't answer that why question. And I think that takes a different approach, approach that expands the aperture, that turns the camera on on the full sweep of society and not just look at those that are you know, brutalized by our poverty. I want to ask you to summarize your answer to why there's poverty. Um, you give a 200-page answer. I, I tried to boil it down to a few sentences. Um, let me give you my rough, uh, my, my version, and then you give me yours. Um, the reason for poverty is exploitation. We cheat the poor as laborers. We cheat the poor as consumers. This is my paraphrase, not your words. We short shrift them on government aid. We wall them off from opportunity, especially in the places we live, and then we blame them for not thriving People are poor because others benefit from them being poor. What would, is, there, is that the gist of it? Tell me what you would add. I ran across this line by the novelist Tommy Orange, which I quote in the book, and he writes, these kids are jumping out of the windows of burning buildings, falling to their deaths. And we think that the problem is that they're jumping. And when I read that sentence, I was like, man, that sounds like the American poverty debate. So you're right. How so? This is a, Say more. What's that? How? how, how why, why did that ring um, true to you? What more? What, what did that tell you about the American poverty debate? It just seems we've been focusing on the jumpers, the poor themselves, asking questions about their work ethic or their families, asking questions about their neighborhoods. I think we should have been focused on the fire. You know, who lit it? Who's warming their hands by it? So you're right. This book is about how some lives are made small so that others may grow. There's just some beautiful writing in it, um, Matt. As uh, and, and as somebody who you know spends his days reading poverty research, it's so refreshing to c- come across someone who can um, make us see things so freshly, so powerfully. I I I, I can't resist. I I, I want to read a few um, passages. And I want want you to read something um, as as well. It it was a, a hard task um, trying to. Pick what what I most wanted to read. Um, let, let me share two passages with with our with our viewers. You write: People benefit from poverty in all kinds of ways. It's the plainest social fact there is, and yet when you bring it up like this, the air becomes charged. You feel rude bringing it up. People shift in their chairs, and some respond by trying to quiet you, the way mothers try to shush small children in public when they point out that something that not everyone. When they point out something that everyone sees but pretends not to, a man with one eye, a dog urinating on a car. That's an image I, uh, of, of the sort you are unlikely to in- encounter in most poverty reports. Here, here's you writing about um, the, the payday loan industry. You can read injunctions against usury in the Vedic texts of ancient India in the Sutra scriptures of Buddhism and in the Torah. Aristotle and Aquinas both rebuked the practice. Dante sent money lenders to the seventh circle of hell. None of these efforts did much to stem the practice, but they do reveal 
that the unprincipled act of trapping the poor in a cycle of debt has existed at least as long as the written word. Um, Matt, I sent you a, a, a passage I was hoping um, you would read on page 121. You got it. We prioritize the subsidization of affluence over the alleviation of poverty. The United States could effectively end poverty in America tomorrow without cre- increasing the deficit if it cracked down on corporations and families who cheat on their taxes. We allocated the newfound revenue to those most in need of it. Instead, we let the rich slide and give most to those who have plenty already, creating a welfare state that heavily favors the upper class. And then our elected officials have the audacity, the shamelessness really, to fabricate stories about poor people's dependency on government aid and shoot down proposals to reduce poverty because they would cost too much. Glancing at the price tag of some program that would cut child poverty in half or give all Americans access to a doctor, they suck their teeth and ask, but how can we afford it? How can we afford it? What a sinful question. What a selfish, dishonest question. One asked as if the answer wasn't staring us straight in the face. We could afford it if we allowed the IRS to do its job. We could afford it if the well-off among us took less from the government. We could afford it if we designed our welfare state to expand opportunity and not guard fortunes. Exploitation looms large in your analysis of poverty causation. Um, Is it the cause or a cause? It's a major cause. And I know exploitation is a very charged word, but I think a good way to think about it is just choice. When we don't have choice, we have to accept bad options because they're often the only options available. So in the housing market, for example, a lot of poor families, there's one option about where to live. You got to live in the private market and rent from a private landlord and devote at least half of your income to rent and utilities. That's most poor renting families today. They're shut out of home ownership and they're shut out of public housing because our nation hasn't invested in ensuring that every American has a safe place to live. And so they're overcharged for crummy housing in disadvantaged neighborhoods. They don't take that option because they did this shopping around and that's the one that they can afford. They take this option because it's the only one on the table often. Tell us um, some of the solutions, both at the government level and the personal level. Um, One of the things I should note about the book is it um, dwells on each, both what we can do collectively and what we should be trying to do individually. Why don't you start with the government? What's your platform? Sure. So we have to make deeper investments in fighting poverty, and we absolutely have the resources to do so. A recent study showed that if the top 1% of income earners just paid the taxes they owed, not paid more taxes, just stopped evading taxes, that we could raise an additional $175 billion a year. That's a lot of money. That's enough to more than double our investment in affordable housing. It's enough money to reestablish the child tax credit, which, as you noted, so much to lift families out of poverty during COVID. I mean, $175 billion is almost enough to pull everyone out of poverty. And so we can do this. And the, uh, the, uh, Tell me more off- about what you'd spend it on. Oh, my gosh. I'm very open to this. I think there's really strong evidence that the child tax credit was incredibly effective. We cut child poverty in half in six months with a subsidy that went to moderate and low-income families. It was hugely effective. I think investing in affordable housing, especially permanent affordable housing, would be incredibly great return on investment, for example. And then the book makes an argument for longer term solutions. You know, so we don't just treat the symptoms, but we really treat the disease, which is a which is a powerful argument that I try to lay out in the book. I, I don't think that the, the, the policies or the um, pay fors are the hard part. I think the hard part of this political will, and that's that's where we come in. That's where individual action is incredibly important for moving the hands of Congress and corporate leaders. Well, you spend um, uh, a good part of your prescription has to do with unionization and raising 
um, wages, including the minimum wage. Say a little about that. The minimum wage, the federal minimum wage, has not been raised, as you know, in over 13 years. This is absurd. This is cruel. But many other countries, they allow someone like the Secretary of Labor to just evaluate the federal minimum wage every year and raise it. So we don't have to wait around for Congress to get its act together. It's it's just, I mean, it's hard for me to put into words the anger I have that so many low-wage workers have been waiting over a decade for a pay raise from Congress. I also think that we need to attack the unrelenting exploitation of the poor in the labor market and the housing market and financial markets. So unions have a really great track record of doing just this. And one idea that I'm excited about is secretarial bargaining. This idea that instead of organizing one Amazon warehouse at a time, we take a vote where every warehouse worker you know, votes. And if we have enough votes, the Secretary of Labor moves and has a panel that's worker representative and corporate representatives, and they come to some agreements. This is a way to organize all those warehouse workers in one go. And it's been incredibly effective in Europe to raise worker standards and benefits. One thing that's unusual about what you prescribe is that you go beyond the government and have a list of things you think people should do in their personal lives. <laughs> Honestly, Matt, sometimes it's a it's kind of an exhausting list um, to to uh, uh, do all the things you suggest. Tell us about some of them. I think we need to commit to becoming poverty abolitionists. I think that this belief shares with other abolitionist movements the perspective that poverty isn't a minor social ill or just a necessary evil, but abomination, something that we shouldn't tolerate. And poverty abolitionism shares with other abolitionist movements, including the movement to abolish slavery or mass incarceration, that, you know, profiting from someone else's pain diminishes all of us. So what does this mean? That means we we shop and we invest in solidarity with low-income workers. Don't we bear some responsibility when our savings accounts go up and up, even when those investments come at the form of a human sacrifice? I think a poverty abolitionist wants a better welfare state, a welfare state that invests deeper in fighting poverty and doesn't do so much to give the wealthiest families in America more. And you, I think you, poverty- you argue that people should um, exercise their power as uh, consumers to uh, choose between companies. Say more about that. Right. I think a lot of us are shopping according to certain values, like environmentalism. We know where our, our cucumber is, is local, it's organic, but we have no idea what the farm worker got paid picking it. You know, we buy the right kind of shoes or drink the right kind of coffee to signal political affiliations, but we have no idea if the workers are unionized making those shoes or making those coffees. So I think organizations like B Corps or Union Plus, which curate lists of union-made products or socially and environmentally conscious companies can be our guides to these decisions. And look, I don't think poverty is going to be solved because I shop at this store and that one. But I think if enough of us did it, it builds a political will. It creates a new kind of common sense and it sends a strong message to our leaders that we are done with this, that we want to divest from poverty as a nation. There's a tension in the book at times I sensed between a part of you that wanted to say, um, hey, we can do this. This is this is easy. We know how to do this. We can get this done. Like um, you just said, if we just all paid our taxes, we'd have an extra $200 billion to spend on the poor. And another part of you um, uh, that wanted to acknowledge the complexity and the difficulty. Maybe it's the um, – the, the, the preacher's son part of you versus the sociologist part of you. You were urging us on to action um, in some places and then in other places cautioning us that it was going to be hard. So what do you really think? Tell us more about that. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair tension. That is a tension in the book because on the one hand, right, like I just said, we can make these deep, massive investments in ending poverty just through ter- fair tax implementation and enforcement. But on the other hand, I think we have to start pushing and building toward longer term solutions. One way to think about this is short versus long term. Let's take housing. In the short term, we could do things tomorrow, like immediately expand housing vouchers or uh, enforce a sensible rent stabilization to make sure landlords turn a profit 
but make sure tenants aren't crushed by the brutal rental market. Short-term necessary solutions that can happen immediately. But in the long term, we need to start expanding the housing choice for our poorest families, building on-ramps onto homeownership, investing in things like permanently supportive housing, cooperative housing, um, these kind of more enduring solutions that kind of cut poverty at the root. In, w- in one place you write, you caution us, doing the right thing is highly inconvenient, time-consuming, even costly. You write it's uncomfortable, painful, dishonest to suggest otherwise. But then elsewhere you say we could end poverty tomorrow. Um, you just made a distinction between short-term and long-term. I thought maybe you were making a distinction between raising revenue, which you considered easy, and integrating neighborhoods, which you were describing as more difficult and time-consuming? The book makes a case that segregation is a major cause of poverty. Look, a lot of us, and by us here, I'm, I'm really talking to affluent white viewers. A lot of us have built walls around our communities, and we've hoarded opportunities behind those walls. These walls are made out of laws. There may be no more soulless phrase in the English language than municipal zoning ordinance. But those ordinances really reveal the soul of our community. You know, on most residential land, you can only build a single detached family home. And that concentrates affluence, but it also concentrates poverty. It's the side effect of our stockpiled opportunity, which is why I think we do have to tear down the walls and fight for more open, inclusive communities, more choice. You were just mentioning the child tax credit. For viewers who are not quite sure what that is, it, it's really a, uh, what you're talking about, the expanded child tax credit that briefly existed in 2021. It's kind of a great, it's a guaranteed income for families with children. It says right. um, pretty much anybody who's raising children gets uh, a government subsidy of several thousand dollars a year. Um, is that what... It, Tell me what the, is that easy? Is that what you consider easy as opposed to integrating neighborhoods? Is that something you, could oh. be done? We did it. Can raise yeah. the money. Is that? Yeah, I mean, in a way, I mean, by easy, I do. I mean, I would say feasible, utterly, you know, irresistibly feasible. And I think Congress that, passed a law last time in March, and the checks went out in July. They went out in July. Um, it's a it's a program that has a price tag, but it's a price tag that country can absolutely afford through sensible tax implementation. So I really have an aversion to criticisms about things that cost too much in this wealthy nation, especially when you just look in the welfare state data and realize how much money we're spending on the richest families. Just one quick statistic. Um, If you look at tax breaks, social insurance programs, means-tested programs, kind of add up everything the government does for us, families in the top 20% of the income bracket are getting around $36,000 a year, but families in the bottom 20% are only getting around $25,000 a year. That's almost a 40% difference. So I think we do need to bring these things into more balance, and we certainly need to make sure the richest among us pay the taxes they owed. You use the metaphor at one point of a wall, and you say you don't just want to throw money over the wall. You want to tear down the wall. The wall, I think, is um, your your metaphor for um, class and racial segregation, They people living apart in different zones of opportunity. So is yeah. um, the child tax credit – you know, uh, uh, is that throwing money over the wall? I'm mean, not that you're against it, um, but is that the kind of solution that um, uh, is uh, important but incomplete? Yes, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I take a lot of, uh, I t- I've learned a lot of lessons from social science, you know, and so there was an experiment in a county in Maryland where they randomly assigned families that were living in public housing. And some of those families were assigned to affluent neighborhoods with affluent schools. And some of those families were assigned to poor neighborhoods with poor schools, but they just dumped incredible resources into those schools. And they watched what happened to the two kids. 
And the kids that moved into the, the affluent neighborhoods and went to the more integrated schools, they did much better than the kids who lived in poor neighborhoods, but their schools were still inundated with resources. Because even when you pour resources into a school like that, it doesn't bring it anywhere close to, to equal. So I do think broad prosperity is a big solution to poverty. And I guess the reason I care about this so much is that segregation is really a microcosm for the whole problem. It's like the Tolstoy quote that begins my book, that we imagine that our sufferings are one thing, their sufferings are one thing in our life is another. And I think segregation allows us this kind of emotional and spiritual distance from the poor, and we should have more skin in the game. We well, should say, realize... Say more about what you mean by um, desegregation. You're using the Montgomery County example, so is the... You're talking about building low-income housing in affluent neighborhoods. Absolutely. Choice. More choice. Now, a lot of folks that are living in low-income communities... Why is that so important? Because it works, right? Because it works. I mean, we have this incredible work by uh, Rucker Johnson, the economist at Berkeley, for example, that looks at what happened to kids after Brown versus Board of Education and the African-American kids that went to schools that integrated versus the African-American kids who were remained in segregated schools. The black kids who went to the integrated schools did much better later on in life, and the white kids in those schools were not thrown off track. Integration works. And I think it works not only kind of in a material way, but I think also in a spiritual way. You know, when we have these kind of segregated communities, we can fall into this pattern of private opulence and public poverty. Those of us that withdraw from lower income communities often want to withdraw our taxes too. We don't want to go to the park. We can buy our own country clubs. We don't want to swim in the pool. We can buy our own private pools. And the more that locks in, the more that it creates a kind of mass inequality in America that I think diminishes us all. So and your argument forward. isn't just about what's going to happen in the classroom when the affluent kids and the poor kids get together. Your argument is a political economy argument about what's going to happen to the school system when affluent parents feel that their own children's futures are at stake. Yeah, we have to confront that, right? And so there's solid research that shows that when affordable housing blends into a community, is well-built and well-managed, it has no effect on property values, none. And there's great research that we can integrate school systems in ways that benefit everybody. And look, for those of us that are striving for a, a fairer, more open community, our values cannot stop where our property line begins. And I hope that more of us show up at those Tuesday night zoning board meetings and stand up and say, look, this community's longstanding tradition of segregation ends with me. I refuse to deny other kids opportunities my kids have had living here. Let's build this thing. Um, your critique, I think, puts you um, certainly at odds with parts of the right on poverty and maybe parts of the left as well. Um, I'm curious how you see your position on the uh, within the debate. Where where do you think you um, disagree or or agree with both left and right? Sure. On the conservative point, I push back really hard against this myth of welfare dependency. I just don't think the data support it at all. The idea that you know if you provide government spending, people are just going to stay at home and and pull a check. The data just don't show that. In fact, what the data show is a much bigger problem, which is welfare avoidance. The fact that low-income families aren't taking advantage of aid that they need and deserve, and they're leaving billions and billions on the table each year. This is decidedly not a picture of welfare dependency. This is a picture of our nation not doing a good enough job of getting that aid to those families. But we're, I mean... Conservatives in America also have been some vocal advocates against mass incarceration. From some conservative corners, you're hearing calls of, hey, this is massive state overreach. I agree with those calls. And I think conservatives on the ground level in the American public, they share a lot with progressives. You know, most Americans now want a $15 federal minimum, federal minimum wage. Most Americans think that the rich aren't paying their fair share of taxes. So I think in the public, there's a lot more overlap on economic justice issues than we often think. 
Should I'm, I talk I'm, about the I'm left? Not, I'm not sure the um, animating concern of among conservatives is dependency. It's, it's certainly it's a concern. But I would say the north star for most or many conservatives is work. They want benefits tied to work. Um, so is that um, an area where you agree or disagree? I, I guess I see those in in the same vein. We heard so much in COVID about welfare dependency leading to folks not working. You know, uh, we thought that the extra unemployment checks were causing folks to stay home. Republican leaders tweeted and and talked about this incessantly, but the data just didn't show that. Right when some states lifted their extra unemployment benefits or lifted or let expire the added relief packages that were rolled out during the pandemic, their job numbers didn't shoot up. Those states basically had the same job growth as states that kept some of the benefits. It just wasn't true that people were staying home because we were paying them to do so. I think work is incredibly meaningful for so many Americans. And so if we believe in the value of work, let's let's go for a workplace that's dignified, where works workers feel empowered, where wages increase, where there's some benefits attached to those. In the book, I summarize a sociologist that said, you know, our grandparents, they had careers, our parents had jobs, and we have, we complete tasks, which is kind of the story of the working poor and working class anyway. So I don't believe... Well, I think that is an area where you and conservatives would um, disagree, that most conservatives see more opportunity in the market than you do. You go through a, talk about a conservative study called the success sequence, I think, um, yeah. where that argues if you finish high school, work full time, and wait to get married before you have children, the poverty rate is 2%. Um, yeah. You looked at that, you have some disagreements with it, but that's, I think, the conservative vision. Yeah, you know, those are really great things to tell to your kid but they're not a solid theory of how the world works. And if you look at that, why not? Because if you look at the data, you learn that most of the action there is just about getting jobs. You learn that more poor people actually played by those three rules than didn't. And you learn that, you know, African-Americans who followed the success sequence, who got a job, waited to get married, you know, finished high school, um, they were, they had much higher rates of poverty than white folks that did too. I, I wish it was that simple. Well, you I could. Truly you, do. There's two. I think there's two ways of responding to that theory. One is you're saying, well, there's racial differences. That's true, um, um, or that um, you know it's all mostly because of one factor, not another. Part of what I liked about Evicted was you showed how hard it was for disadvantaged people to do those three seemingly simple sounded things. Um, so you talk about a girl woman in evicted named Crystal who just suffers a life of you know terrible abuse <laughs> that you, you start by saying her mother was stabbed 11 times when she was pregnant and then Crystal was born and it you know goes from basically goes downhill from there. She's abused as a child. She develops mental illness, addiction. She's arrested. She's foster care. Um, so uh, I thought of Crystal when I thought of the success sequence. Yeah. Um, but there's a tension there, right? So for the success sequence works for a lot of people and doesn't work for others. And tell, say, say more about Crystal and the, and the success sequence. I think... There are some Americans that don't realize how hard poverty is on some people's lives. And so asking someone like Crystal, who had an incredibly rough, hard life full of violence and eviction and homelessness um, since she was a child, to ask her to just get a good job or just get married is kind of like asking her to have a different life, um, to do something that is 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 quite detached from her, her everyday reality. I don't think we we devalue at all the the importance of work or or marriage or education when we say these things are important but they are are not sufficient 
to explain why there's such vast poverty in America? There's, uh, when I think about the success sequence, it seems to, it, it suggests there is a formula that works for a lot of people, and yet there are a lot of people for whom that seemingly simple, those seemingly simple steps are out of reach. Um, speaking of Crystal, I thought of her when I was thinking about your argument about exploitation. Um, when most people read Crystal's story, they might feel incredible sympathy for her. Um, they might um, think she's an example of a terrible tragedy. They probably wouldn't think she's poor because I'm exploiting her, right? She's abused by a step-parent, I think it was. She's got mental illness. She's Her mother, I think maybe even her grandmother, was uh, drug addicted. There are all mm-hmm. kinds of tragic problems in this family. Um, it, it wouldn't, most people wouldn't think, but you know, I'm exploiting her. So tell me where exploitation comes in in the stories of people like Crystal. Sure. One way it comes in is just what happened to Crystal when she turned 18. So Crystal turns 18. She ages out of foster care. She can't get affordable housing. So she starts renting an apartment that takes 73% of her, her income. Um, so she's left out of you know, she's out of uh, any government help when it comes to housing. And that soon leads to her first eviction and then another eviction. And she soon descends into street homelessness. Now, what if when she was 18, the government intervened in her life in a powerful way and said, all right, we're going to stabilize your housing. We're going to provide you stable, affordable housing because we believe that this is necessary for human flourishing. Every one American needs this. Now, how am I involved in this? Or how are other well-off Americans involved in that story? Well, in 2020, uh, we as a country spent $193 billion on homeowner tax subsidies, especially the mortgage interest deduction. Most of that money went to families with six-figure incomes. That same year, we spent only $53 billion on direct housing assistance to the needy, to people like Crystal, which means that you know most folks that qualify for housing assistance, that need housing assistance, don't get it. But everyone who has a mortgage can take the mortgage interest deduction. You know, we have a universal housing program. It's an entitlement. It's just not for poor people. It's not for people like Crystal. And this is where many of us have skin in the game in a story like Crystal's. I interrupted you when um, I asked you a question and didn't let you answer about where you agree with left and right. Um, we talked a little bit about the right. Tell, tell me about the left. That was a great question. Big question. Thank you for it. So on the left, I think that uh, there's a lot of agreement, uh, but I think there's some uh, there's some ways I break with uh, with progressive arguments as well. One place is, you know, a lot of progressive solutions to poverty are just kind of about more, you know, turning on the faucet more. And the argument in the book certainly goes for deeper investments in ending poverty, but it says we also have to attack exploitation and we also have to attack segregation. And so I think that things like a guaranteed income are really a great first step, but they are not the last step. I also break with the left in, um, you know, some pockets on the left, they kind of lay the blame of of poverty at the feet of the conservatives. You know, oh, if only Congress was different, if only conservatives thought differently. And and I I find that very absolving and I have a resistance to that. You know, I quote a study that shows that liberal homeowners are less likely to vote yes on an affordable housing project than conservative renters. So it suggests that, you know, maybe we're not so polarized after all. You know, maybe above a certain income level, we're all segregationists. You, just one more quick, you quick think thing the on. affluent elite are pulling up the ladder? Y- yes, and and, uh, and allowing their progressive values to stop where their neighborhood begins. I, I think that for those of us who are truly interested in the project of more freedom and economic opportunity, we have to be truly interested in those things happening in our own communities. I interrupted you. What were you going to say? No, I'm sorry for my rambling answer, Jason. So I just also like on a spiritual level, I think there are some 
uh, members of the left that are pretty nihilistic right now, pretty <laughs> hopeless. And I, I just find that hopelessness uh, really not useful. And I am in good company with kind of anti-poverty movements who are optimistic, who are ambitious, and who are really trying to bring about a, um, a, a better country. You know, the book calls for the end of poverty. And for me, that's not just rhetoric. I think this is something that's utterly attainable for us to strive for. Well, I do have to say, Matt, you're the first person I've heard um, say that a universal, a guaranteed universal income would be the first step. Um, uh, um, I think most people um, think of it as a um, enviable, if but possibly unattainable goal. Um, I want to just go back to the conservatives for, for one minute and mm. try to channel the arguments I hear from conservatives. Um, you know, there really isn't anything in your book about personal responsibility. Um, which is something you would hear a lot about if you were um, going around interviewing conservative um, uh, poverty experts. There's nothing really about addiction. Um, you know, opioids have killed a million people. Um, crime doesn't really um, factor in very much. So, uh, you know, coming back to the conservative argument that. Um, we do have, yeah, there's a, there's a formula for success. Finish high school, get a job, stay out of prison, don't do drugs, get married before you have kids. Um, I, I think that's what you would uh, hear um, in a conservative audience in terms of reacting to your book. Yeah, I, I disagree, my friend. I think there's quite a lot in there about personal responsibility but it's our responsibility. You know, it's the responsibility okay. of the, the privileged, the protected classes. You know, we do have a culture of poverty in America. You know, it's a culture of exploitation. It's a culture of opportunity hoarding. It's a culture of segregation. It's a culture of shortchanging workers, overcharging renters, sacking the poor with billions of dollars in overdraft fees every year. That's the culture of responsibility that I'd like us to take a hard look at and how that we are often bound up in another person's suffering. As you know, I've written a lot about addiction in, in, in Evicted. I, I spent a lot of time with folks that were struggling with that. And so I think taking a hard look at those things is important, but I also feel like we, we've been doing that. And I'd like to shift the camera a little bit. I'd like us to look at our responsibility and how why we might be complicit in all this poverty. Um, we were talking about the left. Um, there's uh, been... Uh, one of the things you argue uh, in Poverty by America is that the country has made no progress uh, on poverty, I think, in 50 years. Um, there's been uh, some people push back on that. There are two different – let me try to explain something quickly for our readers, our viewers. Um, there are two different poverty measures, one called the OPM, one called the SPM. The OPM does not um, – uh, count most government benefits as income. The SPM for Supplemental Poverty Measure um, does. Um, you use the measure that um, does not cover count government benefits and found no progress against poverty in 50 years. If you use the alternate measure, you would see a different trend. You'd see substantial progress uh, uh, over the past 50 years. So why did you choose to use the measure you did? If you use the regular supplemental poverty measure, it tracks with the official poverty line. In fact, it shows more poverty than the official poverty line over the last 50 years. Because when the supplemental poverty measure accounts for certain government aid that the official line doesn't, that's more than offset by higher costs of, of living, especially housing and healthcare costs. To really show big reductions in poverty, you have to use pretty unique measures that I think really don't reflect reality. So let me one way to think about this is if we had a measure, a technical measure of happiness, and that measure said the country is getting way happier over the years, but then we saw, well, suicide's going up, depression's going up, anxiety's going up. I think we'd look at that technical measure of happiness and say, something's off here. And so for those of us that believe that the country's had these massive reductions in poverty over the last several decades, I think we have to contend with the fact that 
you know, since the 2000s, evictions are up 22%. The share of families that go to food pantries is up almost 19%. Since 1989, uh, non-mortgage debt, like so bad debt, is up over 200% adjusted for inflation for low-income families. Um, since that time, you know, the number of families that are that are drawing food stamps, but no cash income, something that you've written about with such clarity, Jason, that number has more than quadrupled since 1990. So if we want to measure hardship, let's measure hardship. And when we do, we see some really troubling trends on the horizon. Um this sounds like um, a bit of a green eye shade question about data measurement, um, but it has implications for the for political framing. Mm-hmm. Um, if you say that, um, as as you do, that the government spends a lot of money, and one, you said one of the things that surprised you when you started doing the research for the book was that um, you had thought funding had fallen. In fact, it had stayed steady or increased over the past decades. Um, uh, so if you're arguing that we're spending lots of money and nothing gets better, um, the potential risk is that somebody will say, well, then why spend the money? Um, that was essentially Ronald Reagan's argument um, in the 1980s. We fought a war on poverty, poverty won. Um, uh, I think um, what, what's, your, what's your thought about that? Yeah, well, I don't see it that way. And uh, the anti-poverty movements that I'm accountable to, when they call for a broader view of poverty, they don't see it that way either. And for me, some of the arguments about massive reductions in poverty bring to mind another Republican president, uh, George W. Bush, when he stood in front of that big banner that read, Mission Accomplished, you know, when there was so much more work left to do. You know, some of these measures suggest that there's only 2% of poverty in America. You know, Angus Deaton, the Nobel laureate in 2018, estimated that 5.3 million people in America were living in abject poverty by global standards, living on $4 a day or less. Mission accomplished? No. And so I think we should actually lean into the puzzle. I think we should be like, what is going on? And I think what's going on is that we haven't attacked poverty at the root You know, when the Great Society and War on Poverty were launched in 1964, they were launched during a time where unions were strong, wages were rising. But now unions are weak and wages are stagnant. A study showed that a worker without a high school degree would be earning 10 percent less in 2017 than he would have or she would have in 1979, adjusting for inflation. That's a recipe for spending more to stay in the same place because the job market isn't pulling its weight. Or let me just give you one quick example from how you said mission accomplished. Um, Yeah. I don't think anybody's arguing mission accomplished. Um, You could say that the data show poverty has fallen by half since 1970 and that that's ridiculous in a country of the whole rest of your argument would stay intact that poverty is an abomination, that we can afford to eradicate it, that we should be doing much more, that we all bear responsibility for it. Yeah. Um, uh, it doesn't mean mission accomplished. It's um, it, it's saying that what we've done has had some effect. Yeah, I, I think that's true. But I also think that some of the measures that some folks use really do show lower than believable rates of poverty. But I, I love your your move here, which is saying let's let's broaden out and talk about the bigger picture because, you know, the the poverty line, all poverty measures are flawed, right? All of them have certain limitations, and the bigger picture is I think we have much more economic hardship in the country than we should tolerate, and there's certainly plenty of quote unquote poverty as a lived experience above the poverty line. You have you a know, beautiful but- um, uh, sentence in the book that um, there's a lot of poverty above the poverty line. And let me explain right. what that means for viewers. The poverty line, any poverty line is arbitrary. We set it at a certain level. If you're above it, you're, or if you're below it, you're poor. It's an income level. If you're above it, you're not. You and I both know there's all kinds of hardship above the poverty line. But right. that's a different, the level of poverty is a different measure than whether we've made progress by a fixed standard. Yeah. 
I mean, I think that the conversation about progress is very complicated. Some aspects of poverty today have improved. Some aspects, I think, have gotten worse. So mass incarceration has grown over the last 50 years. I don't think any of us would say that's a big improvement in poverty, right? And by the way, most folks in jail and prison, I think all folks in jail and prison are not counted among our poverty statistics. Housing has improved during that time. The quality of housing has gone up, but housing costs have also gone up. So the cost burden is worse, even though the quality of housing is better than it was when folks were living in, in slums and without heat or running water or windows. So I do think I do think this is a trickier question, but I do think that there is a clear story that the data are telling that I think we've been resistant to, which is that the reason we are spending more and not seeing much more progress is because, again, we are not treating the disease, we're treating the symptoms. So if you look at spending on affordable housing, between 2001 and 2019, Inflation-adjusted spending on affordable housing assistance went up about 16%. Our biggest program is housing vouchers, right, which subsidize people's rents. Well, rent during that time went up 15%, which is why since 2000, the number of people served by affordable housing programs have been very flat, even though spending has increased. Again, we're spending more to stay in the same place. We have to address exploitation in the housing and labor and financial markets, along with deepening investments. Matt, there's, um, my list of things that I'd love to ask you um, would go on for another hour, and we don't have that time, so I want to make sure we hit one thing, which is you and I mm. communicated about a little bit by email, which is I thought the um, your greatest passion in the book was your vision of class mixing, and that mm. you were like, yeah, you can have these tax credits, and you can give throw money over the wall, but what what? And let me read you a passage that I thought. Um, uh, got it, which, what really warms your heart. Um, mm. You said, the best place I ever lived was a neighborhood in Madison, Wisconsin. It was a mixed race, mixed income community on the south side called Bram's Edition. My neighbors across the street were a couple who had migrated from South America. A neighbor's house over was an older black veteran who wore copper bracelets around his wrists. You could find him at the local farmer's market playing a drum for tips. Um, yeah, there was a police column um, in a community re- newsletter that read something to the effect of some people use the park to pay, play and exercise. Unfortunately, others use it for shooting. True enough. But these issues didn't define the neighborhood. What defined us, I think, was the community garden where Hmong and Hispanic and white and black neighbors grew beans and peppers and collards and hosted potlucks and jadas, a soul food sh- spot with church basement folding chairs and sweetened yams that I still think about and Taqueria Guadalajara with its pink sign and the best mole de panza this California native has ever had. Um, that's tearing down the wall as opposed to throwing money over the wall. It's not exactly about poverty. Um, it's, I mean, it's about beans and peppers and drums. and mo- why, why does that figure so prominently in your vision? I think it's because the end of poverty is something that benefits all of us. And I think that there's so many of us that are secure in our money, but we feel lonely, we feel scared, we feel icky, because we know we're part of this inequality somehow. Um, And I think that, you know, thinking about my time in that neighborhood and thinking about the times where I've lived in incredibly economically diverse places, are thinking about the times I've lived in my favorite places. And I think that if we're going to call for an end of poverty, we have to make a case not only for what that would mean for so many kids and workers and moms and dads below the poverty line, but I also think we need to make a case for what it would mean to you and you and you, like everyone in the country. And I think that the book makes a case that an America without poverty is a freer America, it's a safer America, it's a happier America, and it's America that's you know, committed to each other's uh, flourishing. Matt, uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you to give you the final word. Um, I come back to the beauty of the writing again because um, I think it's integral to the value of the book. You have a voice that I think can reach far beyond the normal participants um, in the poverty debate and make many more people um, think about what they could be doing personally and politically. Um, would you end with a passage that we talked about on page 180. 
Sure, Jason. Prosperity without poverty would carry a different feeling. Imagine what your life would be like if we abolished poverty. You'd go to bed at night worrying far less about being victimized by a crime for a country that shares its wealth is a much safer country. You'd check the news in the morning and the top stories of the day would not be about a spike in evictions or hours long lines at the food bank or the latest, latest exploitive escapade of some corporation. You'd walk out your door and feel lighter, more secure, and you wouldn't see sprawling tent encampments or the exhausted faces of the working poor commuting to their jobs. You wouldn't be one of those faces as we'd all go to work knowing that we'd be earning a living wage. You'd go out to a restaurant or spend the night in a hotel knowing that the people who are cooking your food or changing your sheets were well compensated. Local and national elections would command higher rates of civic participation and voting. And whatever your lot in life, you'd know that a sudden change in your fortune wouldn't tip your family into destitution. If we had to boil it down to a single concept, we might just say that without poverty, we'd be more free. Matt, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for this and for all your work. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. <laughs>